Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tonight. 1 Corinthians and the 15th chapter. I'd like to begin to read with verse 22 and down to verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting with verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The sting of death is way overrated. We all know in this room tonight that death is coming. It's on our horizon. It is somewhere in our future. Solomon said, a time to be born and a time to die. Every person in this room has a birthday. If I asked you when it is, you would tell me. Perhaps it's today, January the 29th. It's your birthday. But did you know that all of us have a death day? Now, we don't know when it is, but the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. Job said, is there not an appointed time to man upon the earth? Are not his days as the days of an hireling? The eye that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. Death is coming. We have an appointment with death. We don't die because we get sick. We don't die because we get old. We don't die because we meet an unfortunate accident. We die because it's appointed unto men once to die. Man cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Solomon said, all go unto one place. All are of the dust and all will turn to dust again. 2 Samuel 14, verse 14 says, We must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again, neither doth God respect any person. No man hath power over death. Nobody can stay death in its tracks. Nobody can put it aside or, 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 or cancel that appointment. D.L. Moody used to say, I'm a dying man preaching to dying men. Well, is there any hope? Is there any hope for dying people? Maybe there's a fountain of youth somewhere. Maybe there's a, a, a drug or maybe a, a diet or maybe some vitamins that can preserve life. Maybe there's hope to, to, to rewind. Maybe there's a hope to repeat this thing. Is, is there something such as reincarnation perhaps? Is there any hope for the dying? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 is what I would like to call tonight God's life insurance policy. God's life insurance policy. Now, whenever you take out some insurance or you take out a loan or you do something that requires some signatures, it's a good thing to read the fine print. And I believe here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there are four very important paragraphs in the fine print of God's life insurance policy. Let's take a look at them. I first see a paragraph that describes a personal redemption. A personal redemption. Now, God is well aware of our predicament. God understands that we are not going to 
live forever on this earth. Now, God designed us to live forever. Uh, But the Bible says we're made in God's image. We're made after God's likeness. And we know that God is eternal. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, which was, and which is to come. So God is eternal, and God, when he created man, intended man to be eternal. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God intends for man to live somewhere forever. But we learned Sunday morning that Adam and Eve, the first people who lived as human beings, sinned. And the Bible says, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So death is a result of sin. God created us to live. God created us as eternal beings, but death came as a result of sin. And that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need somebody to step in and save us from this eternal death. And that's why God sent His Son into the world so that we could have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in this first paragraph, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see the gospel presented. The gospel presented. Now, what is the gospel? We hear that word gospel kind of thrown around in our culture today. We, we might hear someone say, I'm telling you the gospel truth. And they might use that phrase to describe something they're going to tell you, the gospel truth. We hear sometimes about gospel music. Uh, we have kind of a trend today that talks about gospel-centered preaching. So we hear the term gospel. I was uh, years ago in a, in a revival meeting. I was not preaching it. I was just attending it. And they had a, a speaker that week, a preacher that week, who was also a very good musician. And so every night he would put on a little mini concert of, of uh, he, was a, he was a pianist, and, and he put on a little concert of, of, of piano music and some singing, and, and uh, he was very talented, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so he would kind of sing, and then he would talk a little bit, and he'd sing and kind of explain the next song. And, and one night he, he said, now, for my last song before I preach, I want to sing a song that is the gospel in a nutshell. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay. And I, you know, I was raised in church. I, I know a lot of songs. I, I, I've sung a lot of hymns in my life and, and uh, things. And I thought, well, I wonder, what, I wonder what it is. You know, I began to get curious. And I thought, well, if I was singing the gospel in a nutshell, what, what song would I sing? And he began to sing a song I'd never heard before. And I hope I never hear it again. I don't remember the words of the the verse, but the chorus is forever lodged in my mind. The chorus went like this. Anybody here want to go to heaven? Say I do. Anybody here want to walk on golden streets? Say I do. Can I tell you something? That's not the gospel in a nutshell. You don't go to heaven because you say, I want to go to heaven. I want to walk on golden streets someday. That's not the gospel that saves us. What is the gospel? We see it presented here starting in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now remember, the Bible was written by God. The Bible is God-breathed. It is inspired of God. It's coming through the apostle Paul as he writes to this church at Rome. And he's saying, I'm going to declare to you the gospel. But remember, this isn't just Paul saying, okay, here's my opinion. This isn't Paul saying, here's what I believe. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is teaching us here what the gospel is. 
He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. Okay? So here's the gospel that saves us from our sin. Here's the gospel that gives us eternal life. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now here it comes, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now Paul says the gospel that saves us is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament records very carefully for us the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because that's the gospel that saves us from eternal death and gives us eternal life. Back in John chapter 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he's on the cross now, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The death of Jesus Christ. He wasn't dying for his sins. He had no sin. 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. He had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. He was a lamb slain without spot, without blemish. He was the perfect son of God, but he died. Why? He died for us. Christ died for us. He died for our sins. So he dies. And the Bible carefully then records for us his burial. In John 19 and verse 40, the Bible says, Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes uh, with the spices, as the custom of Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, which never man ever yet had laid. They laid Jesus, therefore, because it was the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So we see Jesus dies. He's now buried. Then the Bible says after three days, he rose again. He came back to life again. He came out of that grave. In Luke 24, in verse number 1, now in the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher. These women came, and they brought spices and ointments that they had prepared, and certain other with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, uh, that they, as they were much perplexed, uh, two men stood by them in shining garments, and they said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. So we have recorded carefully in the Gospels the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. That is the Gospel that saves us. Amen. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. In fact, Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul said, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, Paul was the human author that the Holy Spirit chose to declare the gospel here in this first paragraph of 1 Corinthians 15. Later in Galatians chapter 1, he says, I can't believe you're already moving off center. You're already getting away from the gospel into another gospel, which, by the way, is not another gospel. There is only one gospel. What's happening is people are perverting the gospel. If someone is preaching anything other than the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the gospel, it, Paul said, I don't care if it's Gabriel from heaven. He is to be accursed. I think that means turn off the television, preacher, 
who's preaching something other than the death, burial, and the resurrection is the way to heaven. I think that's saying quit following his blog. Quit going to that church. God says, let him be accursed. Hey, this thing about the gospel is pretty specific and it's pretty important. So the gospel is presented, but notice this is the really neat part. Notice the gospel personalized. If you go back into that first paragraph again, notice the personal pronouns here. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye or you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in mind what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all. Do you see the personal pronouns here? This is a gospel personalized. This gospel is for you. It is for me. You see, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all, and you qualify, and I qualify as one of all. This is a personal redemption. Now, it's based on a proven resurrection. Notice the second paragraph of importance here. It's based on a proven resurrection. The key to our hope of life eternal is in the resurrection. And there is collaborated data. Look at verse number five and that he was seen of Cephas. Now, this is after the resurrection. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present time, this present writing of 1 Corinthians 15. He says a lot of the people that saw him out of those 500, they're still alive. Now, some are falling asleep. Some have passed away, but there are still people that you can go talk to who saw him after the resurrection as Paul writes this. After that, verse 7, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. There is collaborated data concerning the fact of the resurrection. Now, we have confusion in the world today because of what is termed empiricism. Empiricism teaches that you can only call something a fact that you can observe with your senses. In other words, it's empirical. It's, it's something that you've experienced through your physical sentence, senses. You've seen it. You've heard it. You've touched it. You've tasted it. You've smelled it. If you can't do that, then it's not fact. It's merely value. What has happened today in our culture is we have separated truth into fact and value. And the world today says you cannot call something true that you cannot see, hear, touch, taste, or smell. If you believe in something that empirically you cannot experience, we call that a value. It's valuable to you, but you can't force it on somebody else as true because it's not supported by empirical data. Now, do you understand what's happening in our world as a result of the splitting of truth into fact and value? Pastor Chapel's existence is fact. I can see him. I heard him speak tonight. I shook his hand earlier. In other words, I have had experience with this man. I know that he's real. Okay? 
Anybody seen God? The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. You see what the world has done? The world has categorized God as simply a value. You can believe in him if you want to, but don't tell me that that's true because there's no facts. But I want you to notice the empirical data here. See, God, God's way ahead of man. And God knew how man was going to think in the 21st century. And man was going to split truth into fact and, 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 and value. By the way, morality, virtue, ethics, it's all just value. It's all what you believe. Don't force it on me because it's not fact. That's what's happening today. Aren't you glad God left us some empirical evidence in his word? That's why it's so important we understand that this is the word of God. And we can go back and we can prove that this book was written by God. It's so important that you believe the scriptures are from God because this is empirical data. And when he wrote this book, he gave us the empirical data from those people who saw him after the resurrection. They saw him with their eyes. In fact, the, the John writes the book of 1 John, and he says in the first verse, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have handled of the word of life. In other words, what's he saying? I'm giving you fact here based on the empirical data that I saw, that I heard, that I handled of the Son of God. This resurrection of Jesus Christ is proven. It is based on collaborative data, but there is continuous denial. That's why the devil attacks this book, because it's empirical data. That's why the devil attacks the resurrection, because people saw him. They bore witness of the fact that Jesus Christ lived after his resurrection. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, Paul is preaching, and the Bible says, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and they said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. The resurrection is continually denied. Why? Because it is the very foundation of our faith. Verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, there in Acts 17, some mocked, others said, we will hear you again of this matter. Man through the centuries has denied that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They'll admit that Jesus lived. They'll admit that Jesus died. They'll admit that Jesus was buried, but they will deny the resurrection. Because if you deny the resurrection, then Jesus Christ is no different than Mohammed or Buddha or you or Joseph Smith or me or anybody else. The resurrection is a critical doctrine. A critical doctrine. Years ago, I was working a job, and uh, early days of evangelism, working part-time to provide my needs, and I got a job moving this company that had sold their buildings, and they wanted to move everything out. It was kind of a, a machine shop. We had to move these he this heavy equipment. And the man in charge of the project was a 22-year-old was a Jewish man from Israel, very sharp young man, and he was somehow related to the, the, the gentleman that bought this company out, and he was assigned to come to America and, and move these things, and they hired some temporary work, and I was one of those temporary workers, and, and uh, got to know this young man a little bit, very pleasant young man, very, very educated and easy to talk to, and we were talking one day at a little break, and and I said, uh, are, you, are you from Jerusalem? Are you, do you, is that where you live? And he said, yes, sir. That's where I was born and raised, and that's where I make my home now. I said, well, I've, I've been to Jerusalem. He said, you've been to Jerusalem? I said, I have. 
And he said, oh, wow. He said, I don't meet many people. I've been to my country and my city. And he said, uh, who's your favorite place in Jerusalem? Oh, good question. <laughs> and I said, well, there were, there were a lot of really cool places. I said, there were, there were, there were some places that really uh, were beautiful, and there were places that were historically just so significant. And I enjoyed seeing the, the old city of Jerusalem, and I enjoyed seeing the Hebrew University there, and I enjoy seeing a lot of things. But I said, the place that probably moved me was uh, the Garden Tomb. He said, the what? I said, the Garden Tomb, where Jesus Christ was placed after he died. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, um, he said, well, what moved you about that? I said, he's not there. He said, what? I said, Jesus, he, he's not there. He said, what do you mean? I said, he rose from the dead. He said, wait a minute. Jesus rose from the dead? Now, remember, I'm talking to a Jew. who lives in Jerusalem. He said, Jesus rose from the dead? I said, yes, sir. He died on the cross. Yeah, I got that, he said. I know that, I've studied that. I said, he was buried just outside, uh, away from Golgotha in a, in, a, in a tomb. Yes, I'm aware of that. I, I said, and then he rose again. He said, I've never heard that in my life. And I thought of the words of Matthew who said in chapter 28, verse 12, when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, say ye that the disciples stole him away while we slept. And if this saying come unto the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. And the next verse says, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. You see, many have denied this fact of the resurrection, but this is a critical doctrine. Look at verse 13. Watch this now. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? Your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they which also are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It's a critical doctrine. Listen, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, as the Bible says, then we can close the door tonight. We can sell the property here at 40th and Lancaster Boulevard because there is no purpose in having this meeting or any other in a church. We're lost. When we die, it's over. If there is no resurrection... But I'm thankful that the Bible records that, yes, indeed, on that third day, that stone rolled away and he came forth, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. When you prayed that sinner's prayer, someone probably shared with you somewhere along the line in the plan of salvation, Romans 10:9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. It's a critical doctrine. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall also raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. The personal redemption it is a proven resurrection. And because it is a personal redemption, proven by the resurrection, it leads us to the third very important paragraph in this life insurance policy, a perpetual revival. 
Now look at verse 34. Here's the third little paragraph. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. This personal redemption that many of us have by faith received, we understand that it is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he lives, we shall live. And those two facts lead us then to a perpetual revival. We need a righteous awakening. Awake to righteousness. Listen, the church today is slumbering in unrighteousness. We're asleep. And Paul said in Romans 13, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. He says, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. We've got to awake to righteousness, a righteous awakening. We don't need an awakening of happiness. We don't need an awakening of haughtiness. We don't need an awakening of humorous. We need an awakening of holiness. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy based on this redemption that God has given us, based on the fact that he rose again to provide our justification. God says, I have have exhibited grace toward you, and that grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Maybe we need a Mara hat. Make America righteous again. But maybe before America gets righteous, maybe the church better. Because without a righteous awakening, there's a redemption that's aborted. He says, awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. No one will see Christ on the interior of my life if they have to look through the exterior of worldliness. I get kind of tired of people who say, well, God sees my heart. Yeah, he does. And the same verse that teaches you that tells you that man looks on the outward appearance. But we don't want to talk about that. We want liberty. We want freedom. We want to live however we please as a Christian. But when we do, redemption is aborted. Because ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. That's why David, when he sinned, his prayer was, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Then will I teach transgressors their ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You see, verse 13 doesn't happen without verse 10 in Psalm 51. David had to get right on the inside before anything was going to happen on the outside. I'm humbled by what I see in China among God's people. It's truly quite amazing to go there and participate in those churches underground see the love of Christ so pure and so sincere that they're willing to to die, to lose everything. 
And the nation of China tonight is tightening the screws on Christianity. But I'm going to tell the national government of China something tonight. You will never wipe out the Christians in China by harassing them or imprisoning them or putting them to death. Christianity will continue to grow in China as long as people try to stop it with persecution. Persecution brings growth to the church. It always has. It always will. The Chinese government will never stop what's happening in China by following people with cameras, arresting them, interrogating them. But I can tell the Chinese government tonight how to destroy Christianity in China. Just get some preachers to go over there and tell them it's okay to socially drink. Just start telling those Christians it's okay to watch filth in the movies. Just go over there and tell them that it's okay to live in adultery, smoke pot. You have liberty. You have grace. Dress however you want, listen to whatever you want, do whatever you want. You will destroy Christianity in China in a generation. And if you need proof of that, look in the mirror. Look at a map of the United States. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, and ye shall be no priest to me. And because you have forgotten the law of the Lord, I will also forget thy children. That's a promise from God. And if we don't wake up in America to some righteousness, and I'm talking about judgment must begin at the house of God. In this college, in this church, in your connection group, it's got to start here. If we don't wake up, redemption's aborted. And you say, Brother Getz, you sound a little emphatic. Well, it's because of the last paragraph. Look at verse 51 we see a promised return. It's a stated mystery in verse 51. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. Hey, guess what? There's going to be a generation that doesn't die physically because the Bible tells us about a mystery. It's called the rapture. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to catch away his bride. He's going to take those that know him as Savior to heaven through a catching away, a rapture. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we believe also that them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent or precede them that are asleep. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. It's a stated mystery. It could happen tonight. It could happen before we leave the service. Because notice, it is a sudden moment. In verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. It's a sudden moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Scientists tell us a twinkling of an eye is somewhere between a wink and a blink. 
Math people have calculated that to be one-tenth of a second. That's how long it's going to take for us to get out of here. One-tenth of a second. That trumpet's going to sound, there's not going to be time to get prepared. It's not going to be time then to get saved. Not going to get, there's not going to be time then to take some steps of obedience. There's not going to be time then to, to, to witness. It, it, it's a sudden moment of the times, the seasons, brethren. You have no need that I write unto you for yourselves. Know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It's a stated mystery. It's a sudden moment. And thank God, it's a scrapped mortality. Look at verse 53. For this corruptible, he's talking about us right now, and what we talked about last night, this old flesh, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God this old body is going to be done. No more sickness, no more pain, no more crying, no more death. The former things are passed away. It's a scrapped mortality. You won't have one more battle with that old flesh. There won't be any wheelchairs in heaven. There'll be no crutches. They'll, the blind won't be there, nor the deaf. You see, it's a scrapped mortality when Jesus comes. And Paul closes this paragraph with a stimulating mandate. Verse 58, therefore, therefore, boy, don't miss the last paragraph. On the basis of all this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Think of those words in that closing um, a sentence of the paragraph. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, the work of the Lord. Does that describe us? Is that the characteristic of our day? Abounding, unmovable, steadfast. Trouble comes, difficulties come, the wind blows the wrong direction. Are we still steadfast? Are we unmovable, unshakable, always abounding? Good times, bad times, easy times, hard times, unmovable in the work of the Lord. He's coming back. He's coming back. Years ago, an American went to the country of Wales. He took a tour of that beautiful country. His tour took him to many beautiful places, beautiful geographical settings of beauty, historical places. He enjoyed this, this tour. His last day there was a free day on the schedule. There was nothing planned. Those in the tour were told, you can, you can kind of be on your own. You can rent a driver or a guide or perhaps go out on your own by foot and, and see whatever you'd like before we take off back to America. So this particular man, he decided to just go for a walk. The hotel where they were staying was on the edge of a city, and he decided to kind of go out into the countryside and just enjoy on that last day some of the scenery around that particular city. He began to walk. As he walked down a kind of a small road, he, he came to a, a stone fence, a stone wall that was high enough that he, he could not see over it. He thought, there must be something very important behind this wall to have this kind of a protection. And he he followed that wall along for quite some, some distance. 
thinking that he would come to perhaps an opening or, or a gate or something where he could see in to, to whatever it was. And he followed that wall along and finally did come to a, an entry gate. It was closed. It was locked. And so he went up to that iron gate and he peered through into this beautiful estate. Way off in the distance, there was a beautiful castle. But it wasn't the castle that caught his eye. Rather, the beautiful gardens that surrounded that castle. Everywhere he looked, it seemed that every blade of grass stood at attention and saluted him as he looked inside. Every flower was in perfect bloom. Every shrub was trimmed to perfection. It almost seemed like every clump of soil was placed exactly where it needed to be. He, he just he couldn't imagine the work that it must have taken to, to groom those, those lawns and those gardens and those flowers. He, he, he was just stunned. And as he stood there, he noticed off to his left a, an elderly man working in one of those shrubbery areas, doing some trimming. And as he Marveled at all this beauty, that gardener, he, he came closer and closer to the gate to where the man called him, and he said, Sir, and the man came over, how can I help you? The American said, Sir, I'm just stunned by the beauty of, of this place. I, I, he said, you're, you're the gardener? The man said, Yes. He said, Well, how long have you worked here? The man said, Oh, I've worked here all of my adult life. Uh, this has been my job and my home. I work for the man who owns this place, and, and uh, I've taken care of these, these uh, gardens and lawns for many years. And the, the American said, wow. He said, uh, uh, the guy who owns it, he must be a pretty uh, iron-fisted kind of a guy. I mean, he must really have some tough policies and things for you to follow, to, for you to keep the gardens this way. He said, uh, well, I... I don't know. I've, I've never met him. The American said, you, you've, you've never met the owner of this place? He said, no, sir. Well, he said, there, there must be a, a, a manager, somebody underneath the owner that, that gives you orders every morning and tells you what to do next and, and how to do these things. There must be somebody that you, you answer to. He said, oh, yes, there is such a man. I, I've met him twice. The American said, you, you, you've never met the owner? You've only met your boss twice? Why, why he said, the way you keep this place, I, I, it would appear that you're, you're expecting the owner to come tomorrow. The man squared himself up to that American. He said, no, sir. I expect him today. Today, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, as long as the devil can convince us Jesus isn't coming until tomorrow, we'll go out of this service the same way we came in. But if we'll listen to the words in this last paragraph, there's nothing that will revive our hearts any more than to realize that in one-tenth of a second, we could be out and standing before him and giving an account of how we kept the garden. May tonight, we thank God for his redemption. It's a proven resurrection. But it ought to awaken us to righteousness because he's coming back. We will see him. What if it were today? What if it were today?